In this video, we will continue to discuss essential Python programming techniques, and we will build on the topics we have already discussed. I have a brand new Jupyter Lab notebook to discuss examples that we will look at. Remember that I can use Markdown. Whoops. Sometimes it doesn't quite. change it over. Remember that I have two types of cells in a notebook. I have markdown cells which can be used for enhanced documentation of the cell and I have code cells. The majority of what we do, all the Python we do, will be in code cells and if we need a little extra illustration we can add markdown cells as necessary but when I'm going through examples in these videos I will rarely add markdown because I'm annotating the code with my voice a control statement can be described as a way to branch in a program and make a decision based on the state of some variables and then execute code whether that condition that expression is true or false and we build logical expressions using logical operators and relational operators and then we make a decision by putting that parent that expression in parentheses Here's an example. In this case, we're reading from the keyboard. You can see there's an input function. The input function puts up a prompt. The prompt says, enter your favorite integer. We all have a favorite, right? It stops the program, halts, opens up a little input box, waits for you to type and press enter and then assigns whatever you typed over to the variable data and then it attempts to convert data to an int we learned in a previous video that everything typed in from the keyboard is a string therefore if we want to do math on that we have to convert it to some numeric type such as int and then after the data conversion takes place we examine that newly minted integer to see if it is true or false using the modulo operator and I threw this in intentionally because most of us are very familiar with some arithmetic operators add subtract multiply divide the modulo operator however is not one that we saw in grade school when we learned to do arithmetic which is unfortunate in my opinion I think it should be taught along with that subtract multiply and divide the modulo or percent sign operator can be defined as the integer remainder operator and we all learned integer remainders in grade school but we never knew there was an operator that did that for us the application of that operator here is to determine whether a particular number is even or odd because anything mod 2 can only be 0 or 1 if you divide an odd number by 2 you have a remainder of 1 an integer remainder if you divide an even number by 2 you have an integer remainder of 0 therefore you can easily determine if a number is even or odd and that operator is integral in a lot of computations done 
in a lot of fields, particularly cryptography depends heavily on the mod operator. Let's take this code from the slide and go right back over to our Jupyter Lab notebook, paste it in. Looks good. I think even the quotes got pasted in correctly this time. The font that we used that I used in PowerPoint was compatible. And this is easy to run. We can click the run button. We don't have to do anything else. The program begins and it puts up that input box. You can see the prompt. Enter your favorite integer. So my favorite integer is 42 for obvious reasons. I press enter. The program continues from the input statement does the computations, makes a decision using that if expression and either prints your number is even or your number is odd. We can easily break this by entering in something that cannot be converted to an integer. This is going to cause an exception to take place on the second line of that cell where it's attempting to convert to an int and we get that little error message and the error message is pretty good it tells us what line of code caused the problem and it gives us a somewhat helpful error message invalid literal for int with base 10 takes a little bit of study but we can eventually realize that we were calling the int function on something that cannot be converted to an int this would be a decent place to put some error handling logic so while we're at it let's back up to the slides and let's skip ahead because somewhere in these slides we introduce error handling. I am skipping ahead to slide 11. In slide 11 we're using the try, accept, and else construct. And this could also be considered control flow. If anything bad happens in the try block of that code, then we will end up in the accept block and we'll handle the error more gracefully than we did in that previous example. Now it's running. I was in some kind of unknown state in this notebook where I couldn't get the cell to run. So I ended up interrupting the kernel interrupting the environment and starting from scratch so if you're ever totally confused maybe your program is locked up for some reason it's in a loop and it's stuck you can interrupt the kernel that may cause you to get an error message but the error message is self-explanatory it says interrupted by kernel but that's your fail safe is that square button in the toolbar and then we can start over. Now when I start over, I'm going to make sure that the active cell is the one I want to run. I'll make sure that I click in that cell to activate it. And then I'll do the run. Now we were talking about the import statement before we got sidetracked. The import statement brings in external Python code usually written by you or someone else and then you have access to all of the functionality in that library now there's no way to know exactly what's in there without studying that library in advance or having used it in the past so I can't look at this and say oh I know exactly what's in here I'd have to go 
look it up and read about it. But over time, you will gain some familiarity with, with several major Python libraries in this class. And remember that I still have a broken program. I'm still going to get an error. And it's still going to be handled by the environment, by Jupyter Lab. And that's why I get that nasty pink box with all that gibberish in it. So simply importing the library didn't solve anything. But we were talking about how in slide 11 we introduced error handling and we had decided to modify this little code snippet we were working on to do some elegant error handling. The first step then was to import that library because I'm going to use it down here when I print out what the error message is. We'll get to that in a moment. But let's build the framework of the error handling control flow. The first thing I need is a try, followed by an accept, followed by an else. And I can go back and edit my code. The try is going to define what I want to run normally. These are all the things that I want to happen. But if anything goes wrong, I want to end up in the next block of code, which we call accept. And in the accept block, I'm only going to get there if something went wrong. I'm only going to get there if, in this case, I typed in a value from the keyboard that can't be converted to an integer. If there's a problem that takes place right there where we call the integer function. None of this code has to change. This is all great. I just wrapped it around the try. And in the accept, I have decided that all I want to do and I'm going to copy this off the slide. All I want to do is print an error message. There's not much more. I could loop back up and ask the user to enter more data and try again, or I could just print an error message and give up. I'll paste that into my cell. Now I have a rudimentary error handling framework built. And if something goes wrong in the try block, I will end up in the accept block. If nothing goes wrong in the try block, I will never enter the accept block. I will never run that error handling logic, which is good. I don't want to print the word error if there was no error. So let's try it now run that cell, type in garbage, type in something that cannot be converted to an integer. It put me into the accept, the error handling logic, and it printed out the value error message. So it's still not perfect because I really don't know where the error took place. Actually, I got more useful information from leaving it up to Jupyter Lab to handle the error than I got here. But at least I'm handling it elegantly, and I can come back later and build on this if I like. My concern right now is that you're aware that you have a grasp on how to set up the framework for handling errors, and then we can build on that later. So your takeaway is, yes, I can cause my program to process an error message gracefully when something goes wrong, rather than letting Jupyter Lab handle it for me. Flipping back to the slides again, just to finish the discussion, there is an else block that is optional when you implement error handling. And if you have a situation where you want to continue on 
and do more processing, you can add the else block to run additional code. In our case, we don't need it because all of our code is in the try block and if everything goes well in the try block, we want our program to end and not do anything else. We're happy with that. Okay, back to the slides again and let's backtrack to where we were. We left off on slide three where we were talking about basic control flow and an if else expression. And let me point out then this is our first introduction to indenting. When we create the if block and the else block, we need to indent all the code inside each of those blocks to indicate to Python that that code is part of the block. And let me go back and illustrate that through a negative example. In Jupyter Lab, I am going to break this by refusing to indent that print statement. I have an if expression, if num mod 2 equals 0, and that's followed by a colon. Now that colon is an indication that what should follow is an indented block of code, one or more lines of code. But I don't do that. I did not indent the following line. That means when I run this, before it even does anything, it realizes that there's a problem. And it gives me what is a syntax error. They call it an indentation error, expected an indented block. So there you go. It's a pretty good error message that tells you what you did wrong. And it tells you what line of code is offensive. So you can fix that. If I had two lines of code in this if block, in this uh, true block, uh, let's say print, uh, you entered a good number, that must also be indented. Let's leave that in an incorrect state. This program again is broken. Run it. Slightly different error now. The error now appears on the else line because this print statement that's not indented is legitimate. It simply is not part of the previous block and Python is happy with that. But that means the else is out of place because the else needs a corresponding if immediately above it, which it no longer has. Again, it's an indentation error, but you get a different response from, uh, from Python because it handled it differently. Of course, the fix for that would be to indent that line of code. I mentioned in an introductory video earlier that this is kind of unique. I'm not sure if kind of unique is grammatically correct. This is unique. Let's put it that way across programming languages, indenting things to, to indicate blocks is not common. And if I could digress for a moment, what we typically see in the languages that most people use is some kind of delimiter. Opening and closing curly braces are very popular. This would be the C sharp slash C slash C plus plus slash Java equivalent. We use braces to delimit blocks, not indentation. I could write this any way I like as far as indentation goes. And the Java compiler, the c -sharp compiler, would be perfectly happy with that. In those languages, indentation is used to improve readability, is not used to indicate control flow. But the Python world is a little bit different. 
I'm just control Zing away all of these braces. And the Python world wants a colon. That's how we indicate the start of a block. And you indicate the end of a block by simply outdenting your code. I can read that as here is a line of code that is not in the block and Python interprets that as the same. Here is a line of code that is not in the block. But again, this is broken. Okay, we did this a moment ago. This is not going to work because now we have an else that is not attached to an if, which is incorrect, and that causes an error. Okay, let's put this back so that it works. Just leave it in a working state. And I haven't saved it in a long time, so click the Save button. Here's another possibly misleading condition for you. I have what I will assert is a working program in that cell. It is syntactically correct. The logic is right. All the blocks are lined up. But there's still an error message on the screen. So if you were to walk away from this and get a cup of coffee and come back, you might think that your code is broken because there is an error message on the screen. However, that is incorrect because the code is fixed. You just have not executed that code since you fixed it. And the error messages from a previous run of that cell. Uh, this all requires a lot of mental juggling on our part. Another control flow structure is a loop. We can implement a while loop very easily. You can see that um, on slide four. You can see that again I'm creating a block by using that colon operator. Underneath the while statement I indent all of the lines of code that are in that block. So something we've already seen a little bit of. This example starts with the value 100 stored in the variable temp drops into an infinite loop. This while expression will run forever until you manually break out of that loop or turn the machine off. And inside the loop, it repeatedly divides that variable by two until it gets down to zero and then it breaks out. We can copy this. And go right back to Jupyter Lab. Uh, start another cell at the bottom. If you don't have a blank cell, you can hit the plus sign in the toolbar to get another cell. If the cell is in the wrong place, if you inserted a cell and it's not quite where you want it to be, you can drag it and it will move. I've left myself with three empty cells at the bottom. Won't affect the execution of my notebook at all. They're just empty cells. They don't have any code in them. If I don't like one of the cells, I can right click on it and say delete. And I will do that to get rid of two of those empty cells. Now in this newly created empty cell, I can control V paste in the code off of the slide. It should work. I see no reason why. Just at a glance, everything looks lined up and correct. And I have a variable, and I use the variable consistently. So let's give it a run. There's my output. I start with 100. I repeatedly divide by 2 until I get to 0. When I get to 0, I execute a break statement, which takes me out of the while loop.
Python then uses the break keyword to get out of the innermost loop. If I remove the logic that would get me out of that loop, I commented out the check for zero and I commented out the break statement. I've created a pretty bad situation because in Jupyter Lab it has a very difficult time dealing with high volumes of output to a browser tab. And I'm not even going to run this because I don't want to see what it might do to my browser. And I, if you have the situation like this, you may get eventually an error from Jupyter Lab from the environment that says, hey, I just can't deal with this anymore. There's too much output. Or it might just hang up. And at this point in the making of a video, I don't want it to hang up and possibly lose all my work. So be wary of dumping very high volumes of output into one of these notebook tabs. That's a, that's a quirk of the environment that we're in. That's not a quirk of Python. All right, I'm not even going to run it and I don't feel comfortable leaving it in there and accidentally running it later. Therefore, I will take out those comments. Now my loop is guaranteed to break out when I get to zero. I'm curious though, why do I need to convert to an integer in this loop? I mean, if I start with 100 and I divide by 2, I know I'm going to get 50, which is already an integer. But what if I start with uh, an odd number? What if I start with 99? And let's run that with a value of 99 as our starting value rather than 100. And I get 49, 24, 12. Is 99 divided by 2, 49? Well, strictly speaking, it depends on what kind of data types you're using. If you're doing integers, then yeah, you could make that assertion. But what if we weren't doing integers? Now, I don't want to I don't want to edit this code again cuz I don't want to get stuck in some forever thing. So, I am going to go to an entirely new cell and let's just do a little experimentation. And I want to I just want to get your mind working towards trying things and experimenting. And one way to do that is just open up a new cell and type in little snippets of code and see what they do. And that goes a long way towards building confidence and creating a comfort level where you can do more complex things. And let's just do uh, 100.0 divided by 2. Actually, not, not 100. Let's do 99. So I'm taking a floating point number. 99.0. That's not an integer. That's a number that stores decimal places and I'm dividing it by 2. I can just run this individual cell by its lonesome. There it is. Very easy way to experiment. And that would also be something amenable to uh, the Python interpreter shell if you wanted to do it there. But since you have these little notebook tabs cells open, you, may, you can do it here as well. What has this told us? What has this told us? Well, this has told us. This has. Does that sound right? This has told us. This tells us. How about that? This tells us that when we divide a floating point number, we may get decimal places in the result. If we don't want those decimal places, we should put in. And I will make a whole new line. Print int 99.0 divided by 2. How about that? This divides by 2 and then converts to int. 
converting to int is going to truncate the decimal places. No rounding takes place. It doesn't round up. It doesn't round down. It truncates. We lose the decimal places. Running this cell shows us that 99 divided by 2 is 49 using integers. Another just illustration of the way data types can be manipulated. All of this comes with experience. Another kind of loop is the for loop. The for loop is useful for situations where we know the upper bound of our loop in advance. If you flip back to the previous slide, I didn't know when this loop was going to end. Therefore, I just made it infinite and I broke out of it when I realized it was over. And that's fine. That works great. There are plenty of places in, in real life where you do that. One of them would be your car. Your car is an infinite loop. When you start the car, the engine controller begins to loop and it controls the spark and the fuel and the idle speed of your car until you turn it off again. That's an infinite loop. In the next example, slide five, we know that we're stopping at a certain point. And Python gives us the capability of defining that as a range. So by calling this range, I guess it's a function, it will give us a set of values from 0 up to the 5 minus 1. So whatever's in the parentheses is 1 greater than the stopping point. And in this example, all I did was print out those values. And a lot of times then you will do something X number of times. You want to do something five times, you can use the range function to generate those five values for you. Therefore, your takeaway here is you can use a while construct when you don't know the upper bound. You don't know when your loop is going to end. You can use a for construct when you know how many passes through that loop you're going to need in advance. They're both useful in their own particular niches. Let's look at range just a little bit more before we move on. I'm going to go back to Jupyter Lab again, find an open cell and I'm going to just print range 5, whoops, if I can spell it. And it doesn't really give me the same thing I got in the loop, but it still works. So a way to think about this is it's really not a function even though it does use parentheses, you can see it renders in green. So it's a built-in operator that Python recognizes. Okay. Here are some thought experiments for you. Can I use the range operator to count down? Can I use the range operator to count by a different increment other than one? And the answer, as you might expect, is yes. We can do all kinds of amazing things with range. So let's go back to uh, our code. Let's go back to Jupyter Lab and let's just start uh, for I in range 5, okay, and then we'll just put a print statement in here. We know what's going to happen there. It's going to print 0 through 4. 
we get five passes through the loop, but the I value goes from zero to four. But what if I put uh, two comma five? You can see now that it starts at two instead of starting at zero and it goes up to four. And let's make this a minus one. What if I start at minus one? Well, can I do that? Yes, I can. I can start from minus one and I can count all the way up to five minus one, four. What if I add a third argument, two? Now I'm counting by twos. I go from minus one, I add two, I get one. I add two again, I get three, and that's as far as I can go because that adding two again would exceed the range. Range has a lot of flexibility for configuring a loop to start at any number, stop at any other number, and increment by a value. Can I count down? How would I configure this to count down? So what if I start at 10 and I want to count down to 0 and I want to increment by minus 2. What will that do? There we go. So it is possible to count backwards by using a negative increment. In this case I use minus 2 as my increment. And I leave it to you to write little snippets of code to modify the loop to print only even numbers from 1 to 100 or print even numbers from 100 to 1 in descending order. You should be able to modify the way that we use that range operator to do that. I also mentioned on the slide that it would be useful to look up the range value. And let's spend a minute talking about resources. Employers are very much interested in technologists who can solve problems by researching them. We have wonderful textbooks available to us that the Python textbook that you're reading in this course was written by one of the original creators of the language. It's a, it's a well-written book, but while it's comprehensive, we rarely want a take on an entire language once we get good at it. We want to solve individual little problems that pop up or learn how to do things. Therefore, it's better for everybody involved to look things up with a search engine. Or once you've been able to do that, you build a kind of a mental inventory of sites that are useful to you and it makes your searching that much more efficient. And I'm just going to start with the search engine. I'm going to say Python range and you can see that the search engine has already seen many people try to do the same thing and it brought up a very helpful list of things that it thinks you want to know about range. And you can look at that list and say, hey, that's a good tickler. I, I want to know more about Python range function or Python range reverse. And I'm just going to go with Python range. Let's see what it tells us. Now at this point, my experience solving problems with search engines has taught me that W3Schools is a very good resource. So I'm happy to see that come up first. And then I can scroll down and I see that there are numerous websites that are happy to tell me about this topic. 
but I'm going to hit the first one because I like W3 schools. It's straightforward. It's well written. It's clean. It gives an example and it doesn't go into a lot of detail. It's not going to show me every possible way to use the range function over 73 pages of documentation. One sentence summary, create a sequence of numbers from 0 to 5, print each item. This is exactly what we did in our slide, except we went from 0 to 4, not 0 to 5. So I have an example. If I like that, I can stop and I can move on, go back to my code, pick up with my work. If I need to know a little more, it will show me that there is a more complex syntax for this function. And it tells me, as we've already seen, that there is a start, a stop, and a step. I referred to the step as the increment. If I want to know more, there's more examples. So we have seen the W3 schools is a very useful way to get a quick introduction to a topic. Scrolling down, there's not a lot here. Okay, the formal Python documentation for range goes on for pages and pages. And sometimes you just don't want that. You want a short take. W3 schools is a good place to go for that. Back to my notebook again. Let's say that, create a scenario. Let's say that we are trying to get range to work and we're not really understanding it. So here is an example of a problem. We know that the first argument is our starting point in the range. The second argument is our stopping point plus one. The third argument is our increment or our step. Well, we can't get from 10 down to zero by incrementing by two. Okay, we're going to go 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and we're not going to get to zero. That's a problem. That's a logic error. Logic errors cannot be identified by Python, by any programming language. Syntax errors, sure. Is there a colon out of place? Is the indenting wrong? Did you use a variable name when it wasn't uh, initialized? Sure. But logic cannot be uh, identified. You, you have a a uh, vision of how your program should work and Python doesn't know what your vision is therefore it doesn't know if you're logically incorrect but it is wrong and I'm a little bit hesitant but let's run it and see what happens if I get disconnected I'll come back here we go did it run Ah, okay. This logic error, this is good. It didn't flood the screen with, with output. This logic error simply looked at the starting point, looked at the stopping point, looked at the increment, and said, we're done. We can't do anything. We're finished. And if you don't believe me, let's put another print statement in here. I didn't expect that to happen. That's great. Let's try it. There it goes. What we see then is this range, while logically incorrect, is understood by Python, and it says there's nothing I can do for you here. I can't get from that starting point to that ending point the way you want me to. So that's good. Didn't crash, just didn't run. All right, we have a scenario then where there's a logic error. What do we do? We stare at it, we stare at it, we get up and get a cup of coffee, we go outside for a walk, we come back, we stare at it, we stare at it, we're not sure why we aren't looping. Why isn't anything printing here? What's wrong with my program? Why don't I get any output? 
we're stumped. What we can do is go to another site with which you should become familiar, and that is Stack Overflow. In Stack Overflow, we can post questions and they will be answered by the community. And this is, this is a different kind of world than you might be used to. You cannot simply throw anything up here and get an answer. If you don't put thought and care into your question, it will probably get closed and you won't have an opportunity. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's a little bit of a strict environment. Just be warned. So what we might do, and I'm going to take you through the steps here all the way up to the end. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that I have a problem, okay, and I can't figure out why. So what I can do is grab this code and ask a question. Of course, you'll need an account if you don't have one. I encourage you to create one. And then why doesn't this loop print anything? Paste in our code. Whoops, it wanted to paste it in as a picture. That was weird. Why did it do that? Copy. Oh, let's try Control C rather than Copy Cell. Control C back to SO, control V, that's better. And then I can make that code look like code. And we have a pretty decently formatted, not the best, but a decently formatted and asked question that we can post. We need a tag. Python is probably our only tag here. We could put, I think there's probably a loop tag. Uh, not necessary here, but we could put that in. And now everybody who's looking for Python questions to answer will find our question. We also need a title. Why doesn't this loop print anything? Now the AI on this site is very intrusive. I get a message that says many similarly phrased questions have received feedback like downvotes or requests for improvement. And I mentioned earlier that if they don't like your question it will get closed. It, will, it may also get downvoted. It's a pretty strict community. So I may want to say why doesn't this range statement do anything? That's again not a great not a great question. Again, the AI didn't like it. Why doesn't this range statement give any loop passes maybe. You don't have to respect that message. Okay, you can still post your question. It's just giving you fair warning that you may not have success. Oh, the AI went away. That's good. And they also went ahead and showed you two possible or many possible existing solutions to your question and you can scroll through those if you like the first one says Apache so it's not even Python the second one doesn't give an indication of what language it is the third one says something about array list which we don't even have so you can usually you can eliminate most of these I usually ignore them because there's just too many to look at when I get 
a well formatted well asked question you can see down here this is what my question is going to look like I can click review and it gives me one last chance to change my mind and then I can click post down here now I'm not going to do that because this is a very obvious question and I think the community will pummel me I don't want to lose any reputation points for the sake of this I don't mind losing rep points when I can get an answer to a serious question but I'm not going to submit this if you want to visit me during office hours I'll tell you someday how I almost got the University of Cincinnati kicked off of Stack Overflow if you want to hear that story but I do want you to look for opportunities to solve problems this way I want you to create a Stack Overflow account and I want you to at some point in your experience in this class find a problem that you cannot solve in your own code as you're writing a homework assignment or experimenting and I want you to post that question because it will give you a tremendous experience framing a question for the community and interacting with these uber nerds who answer all these questions it's a great experience for you to go through and it will also give you something to put on your resume because over time and this isn't going to happen quickly you will develop a reputation score and that's something that employers respect and they want they want to know that you're involved it demonstrates that you have an interest in the field and it shows employers that you can de demonstrate competence through this website when you do get to that point and you post a question and even if it gets voted down or closed that's okay send me a screen snip and send me a link I want to know about it continuing back to the slides again the concept and application of a function is extremely important to us because we don't want to write humongous code cells with thousands of lines of Python we want to break our work up into manageable chunks and a function is a named chunk of code that we can execute by its name I am going to grab this code off the slide and I think it's time in our Jupyter lab work it's time to either start over or start a new notebook or delete all these cells because we're getting very cluttered I'm gonna go ahead and just create another notebook I can hit file new launcher and then new notebook just to give me a cleaner look less clutter to scroll up and down the first thing I'll do is just paste in that function the function doesn't do a whole lot but it will print according to the documentation here even numbers from to up to whatever num is okay that's pretty easy to understand and then let's open another cell and let's call our function print underscore even and 42 there we go I've modularized my code a little bit by writing a function that I can reuse or conceivably give to other people and they could reuse it although that would be a little awkward in Jupyter lab and I'm excited I want to see if it works I click in the the cell that calls the function I click run and I get a sad little error message and it makes me cry 
Some of you probably realize what I did. I never ran the cell that defined the function. So even though the function is right there in front of me, it has not been added to my environment. It's not in the kernel. What I need to do is run this cell. Now nothing's going to happen when I do that. There's no output. But it does add that cell to the working environment. And it also gives me that little number there confirming that, yes, I have run that cell recently. <laughs> now I can run the cell that calls the function. There we go. Why do we do this? We do this because it's very, very awkward to write hundreds or thousands of lines of code in one cell. De debugging is almost impossible. Having any deep understanding of the code would be problematic. Therefore, we break it up into parts, which we call functions, and then we invoke those parts individually as needed. Now the coding standard is if we use the three tick marks we can build a little bit of function documentation. They call it a doc string. And inside those tick marks we do two things. We provide a very brief one sentence description of what the function does. And then we describe the parameters pass to the function. In this case, the parameter is called num. We also can describe what that function returns, if anything. And our function doesn't return anything, so it's not in there. But work towards modularizing your code as you write more and more code. Break things up into functions. This thought process, this philosophy applies across development languages and it's also something that employers want to see. They want to see you write quote unquote good code which is part of that is modularity. I bounced back to slide 9. I skipped over 9 a moment ago. Here is an illustration of a function that returns something. In this case, I'm computing the cube of a number. So the function accepts a parameter, which I call num. It performs a cube operation and then returns that result. So let's take this off the slide. Go back to our new work our new notebook and I'm going to tuck in a cell right below the first cell right below the definition of our print even function I'm going to tuck in a new cell and I will paste in this code remember to run the cell so we can have access to the function okay now that cell has executed it's got a little number next to it we know it's been it's available to us now. And let's drag ourselves all the way down to the bottom and add a new cell. I find all this output very annoying. I'm tired of it already. So I'm going to right click on this print even cell and say clear outputs. Okay. I, I'm just tired of having all those numbers there and having to scroll up and down. In this cell, I'm going to call my cube. So print, uh, what do I want a cube? Three. So that's going to be cube three. And that should be 27. There we go. Let's break this. Let's put in a logic error. 
let's say for the sake of argument that I'm going to modify this and I'm going to say answer equals num times num times num. And then my intention is to say return answer. Okay. Logic hasn't changed. I just rewrote it a little bit. But American Idol came on and I got distracted. And I forgot to do this. Okay. My function doesn't return anything. Even though I promised that it would. In my doc string, I have return the cube of num, but I'm not doing it. I made a mistake. And run the cell again, because I redefined that cube function, run the cell. Let's try our call one more time. What happens if I call this function even though it's got a logic error in it? Let's see what it does. None. And what I'm telling you then is if you don't have a return statement, the function returns what we refer to as a null value, but Python calls it none. So whenever you see none, if the word none pops up in your output, that means you probably forgot to do something. In this case, I forgot to return something from that function. And I go fix it, return, answer. Re-execute this cell. Don't forget that will drive you crazy. Redefine the function. Try my call again and I get 27. So all is well. Okay, that brings us to error handling, which we have already discussed with a wonderful example earlier. As a point of clarification, we can do all of this in a REPL environment. We can do everything we've done in this video, but it's awkward. Since it's line oriented and you can only see one line of code at a time, when you type in your function, it kind of disappears. You know it's still there, you know it's available to you in the in the operating environment, but you can't see it anymore. And as you can imagine, redefining that function would be problematic because you'd have to type the whole thing in again. So the way we work, it is much more convenient in Jupyter Lab than it is in this REPL environment. Doesn't mean we couldn't do it. If we were stranded on a desert island with nothing but a REPL environment and we had to write a program to send for help, we could do it, but we would need the help of a lot of coconuts and volleyballs. Here is our first mention of Eclipse. I promised you I would talk about Eclipse now and then. And here I'm just showing you that I can write a program in Eclipse to do air handling. And it might seem like a non sequitur at this point. I will circle back and talk more about Eclipse later. You don't have any Eclipse assignments coming up. It's just something I want you to be exposed to. And you have been so exposed at this point. Thinking big picture. We talked about functions today, and even at a higher level, more complexity, we will be given the job of writing methods and classes. Remember, a method is just a function that's part of a class. And as a team, then, you would probably be assigned the task of writing a class or writing a method or define or uh, modifying an existing class slash method and then that would go in some kind of online code repository to share the code with the rest of the development team. So 
that in my opinion is another one of the shortcomings of Jupiter Lab. Okay, I don't see, I am not aware of uh, a team oriented approach to using Jupyter Lab notebooks. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to create a project and have multiple notebooks in a project conveniently. I mean, I know the mechanism to do it. I just don't think it's easy and convenient. So if you are looking towards enterprise development or group development, use it working with people remotely, then I would not recommend Jupyter Lab if you came to me. I would say, yeah, it's great for prototyping. It's great for learning the language. It's not great for scaling up. Now, there may be some tools that I'm not aware of, and I'd be the first one to, to say that I don't know everything about Jupyter Lab, and I would be happy if there's any of you out there who have uh, group development experience at Jupyter Lab, tell me about it. Let me know so I can learn from you. Here's another exercise for you. Write a function that loops forever. Okay, when, when you see loop forever, you should think while loop. We illustrated that in a previous example. Prompt the user for a number. Read it into a variable. We know that it's a string because everything coming from the keyboard is a string. Convert it to an integer and then break out of the loop. Now, if something went wrong, we have taken the, we have, we have thought ahead and we're building a, a exception handling with a try block and we can deal with that data conversion error. We did all of this today, except we didn't do it in the form of a function. That means you could look back at previous code that we wrote in the last hour and six minutes and paste it into a cell, wrap the function definition logic around that cell and be good to go. And that's a good exercise for you to practice with. And then another good place to go to write simple basic programs is Project Euler. And I'll talk about that just for a moment. Project Euler is a repository of programming challenges that you can solve one at a time if you're so inclined. If it's snowing and you can't go outside and play. They start out very simple. Let me sign in as me. Whoops. They've been hacked quite a few times, so they have this CAPTCHA. Okay, here are the problems. There are hundreds of them, but they start out very, very simple. For example, the very first one you could easily do using the technology that you have read in the book and discussed in these videos. Very simple. So if you want a place to practice code, this is a place to go. You don't need a database. You don't need to import anything. You can just start writing little procedural programs. And then once you get the answer, you type it in and you get a little green check mark. And over time, you build progress. For the, the general framework of this course, this is beyond our scope. We're not really turning you into procedural programmers, but if you do want some practice and you want to polish basic Python programming skills, this might be an opportunity for you. I'm not assigning it, I'm just suggesting it. If you do solve that problem, the next thing you might want to think about is making it into a function. Okay, we're always interested in modularity, so once you've gone to the trouble of solving a project oil or just as an exercise, make it into a, its own function. 
our next discussion will be of scope. It's important to understand where you can see a variable once you've created it. Is it visible to you? And why it's not visible to you in other cells? Because you'll just drive yourself crazy trying to figure out why you're getting the errors that you get and why you're getting the results that you get. And I'm going to create an example based on this slide. So if I go back to Jupyter Lab again, where is it? There it is. And let's start another notebook just to keep the clutter down. And let's say uh, print x and in a completely separate cell, x equals 42. And I'm doing this on purpose because it's just a mistake that many, many people make. And it's important to try to eliminate that very early on. Those of you that have done this before probably recognize what's going to happen here. If I click restart the kernel and run the whole notebook, it starts from the topmost cell and proceeds downward, executing all the code cells. Okay. Well, in the first code cell, we are referencing a variable that does not exist. There is no x. And it's going to fail miserably. So I click restart the kernel. I confirm. And I get an error. It took a minute there. It scared me. And I get X is not defined. But if you're a, a newbie and you're tired and it's the end of the day, you might look at this notebook and say, well, there's X right there. Of course, it's defined. What's wrong with you, Mr. Python? The problem, though, is that these things are executed top down. So it's it runs the print X before it sees the X equals 42 and you have a situation. The fix would be to move this cell above the print and now you're good to go. When you restart the kernel, it runs the assignment statement first. It creates the variable X and then it tries to print it out and all is well. You're fine. You don't get the error message. Please work. Please work. There it goes. I seem to have slowed to a crawl for some reason. So the scope of that variable is all the cells beneath it. The scope of X is not the cells above where you assign the value. It's only the cells below. Here's another example of scope. In the first cell, we're creating a variable called i and we're going to initialize it with a range of values. And then we're creating a variable called J by assigning it a value. And then we're printing I and J, no problem. But then it gets weird because I and J are visible outside of that loop. Okay, the scope of I and J are everything below where you first create that variable, which is a little bit odd. If you're familiar with other programming languages, you might look at that code and say it's wrong because the scope of I and J in most other languages would be just that for loop. They would be limited to that for loop because that's where they were created. But since they're created in the for loop in Python, they're visible outside and underneath that for loop. So that's a scoping quirk of Python.
Another scoping issue is that you can create variables in functions and be assured that those variables are visible in a certain scope. So you can see in this example I create a function called my underscore function and inside there I create a, a variable called beta and I put a hundred in it. Then outside of that function in the same cell however but outside of that function I try to print beta and it fails miserably because beta is out of scope. Now the alpha guy is fine. The alpha guy is created outside of the function so the scope of that is the entire cell and any cells that follow. So let's take that and go back into Jupyter Lab. We can see here that I'm creating a function. There it is. Inside the function, I create beta. Outside the function, I create alpha. And what you want to do is ask yourself, what is the scope of alpha? And you want to ask yourself, what is the scope of beta? <clears throat> Because as a developer, those issues come up and they cause you great confusion. When we run this cell, let's take it from top to bottom. The first thing it does is create alpha and puts the value 42 into it. The second thing it does is create a function. And inside that function, it creates beta. So beta is only visible inside the function. The answer to the question then what is the scope of beta? The scope of beta is the function and only the function. The next thing it does is try to print alpha. No problem at all. Alpha is in scope here. No problem. The next thing it does is invoke the function inside the function it creates beta does its thing with beta and then throws it away beta goes in and out of scope very quickly and then this fails miserably because there is no beta in this scope. There it is. The error message is good. Beta is not defined. With a little bit of study and patience then you can figure out what you did wrong because you don't have anything that's in scope called beta. Here's another exercise for you to do. Use a function to draw the pattern below use nested for loops. This is just a, a way to think about ranges and you can do this with two loops. One loop for each line of this drawing and then inside the line you need another loop to draw the correct number of stars. And then this example 
is the classic programming problem that is given to applicants in, in, in job interviews. It's a well-known uh, challenge called FizzBuzz. It's all over the internet. Everybody talks about how they went to a job interview with Google or some other software company and they were asked to write this program in the interview. It's very simple. It's, you know, a couple of lines of code, but under the pressure of a job interview, it seems insurmountable. All right, so you have a couple of exercises if you choose to work on those. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you very much.